In this video, we're going to focus on solving basic math problems that you may encounter in everyday life. So let's start with this problem. John has seven $50 bills, 12 $20 bills, eight $10 bills, and nine $5 bills. How much money does John have? So this problem involves multiplication and addition. So let's start with the largest bills. He has seven $50 bills. What's seven times 50? Well, we know that seven times five is 35. So the total is gonna to be 350. You just gotta add the zero. Now he has 12 $20 bills. So if he has 12 $20 bills, how much money does he have? We know that five 20s is 100, 10 20s is 200, two 20s is 40. So this is gonna be 240. You could also do it this way. You can actually multiply it. You can perform long multiplication. Two times zero is zero. Two times two is four. Add a zero. One times zero is zero. And then one times two is two. And then add 20, I mean 240, you get 240. So you could use long multiplication if you want to. Next, he has eight. $10 bills. 10 times 8 is 80. And then he has 9 $5 bills. 9 times 5 is 45. So now let's perform addition. So add in the first column of numbers, we're going to get 5. And then add in the second column of numbers. We have five plus four, which is nine. Nine plus eight is 17. 17 plus four is 21. So we're gonna write the one, carry over the two. And then we're gonna add two plus three plus two, which is seven. So he has a total of $715. Now let's move on to number two. Karen buys a pair of shoes for a total of $32.65, which already includes sales tax. She gives the store clerk two $20 bills. How much money should Karen expect to receive back from the store clerk? Well, the amount of money that she expects to receive back is the difference between how much money she gave the store clerk and the actual cost of the pair of shoes. So she gives the store clerk two $20 bills. That's a total value of $40. So the answer is going to be the difference between how much money she gives the store clerk and the price for the pair of shoes, which is $32.65. That's how much money Karen should expect to receive back from the store clerk. So this is basically a subtraction problem. So we're going to subtract $32.65 from $40. The first thing we need to do is subtract the top number by the bottom number. Zero minus five is a negative number, so we can't do that. So we need to borrow a one from the zero, and we're gonna transfer it to this zero, so that becomes a 10. Now this has to become a nine because, I mean, there's nothing to borrow it from, so we need to borrow a one from this, which will also become a nine, but because zero have nothing to offer, we need to borrow a one from the four, which becomes a three. So now we can perform the subtraction. 10 minus five is five. Nine minus six is three. Nine minus two is seven. Three minus three is zero. So the answer is $7.35. And you can plug this in. 40 minus 32.65 is $7.35. Now, for those of you who want to do mental math, here's what you can do. So this is 40 minus 32 minus 65 cents. 40 minus 32 is eight. Now, what I would do at this point, I would break up eight into $7 plus $1.
Now, a dollar minus 65 cents. A dollar is 100 cents. 100 cents minus 65 cents is 35 cents. So you get $7 plus 35 cents, which will give you the same final answer as $7.35. So you could use mental math to get the same answer. Now let's move on to this problem. A team of five college students earned a net profit of $486 in a single day selling t-shirts on campus. If the profit is split equally among each team member, how much will each student receive? So in this problem, we need to perform division. We simply need to divide $486 by five. So let's use long division to accomplish this. So how many times does five go into 48? Five doesn't go into four, so we need to see how many times five go into 48. To find the answer, it's helpful to make a list of the multiple the multiples of five. I'm going to go up to 50. So five times one is five, five times two is 10, five times three is 15 and so forth. Five, well, we need to find the highest multiple of five just under 48. And this is 45. So five goes into 48 nine times. So we're going to put a nine here. Five times nine is 45. And then we're going to subtract the two numbers. 48 minus 45 is three. And then we're going to bring down a six. Now, how many times is five going to 36? The highest multiple of five just under 36 is 35. So five goes into 36 seven times. 5 times 7 is 35, and then we need to subtract. 36 minus 35 is 1. Now, 5 doesn't go into 1, so what we need to do is add a 0. So we need to add a decimal point as well. We're going to treat this as if it's 10, even though it's 1.0. So let's put a decimal point there. How many times does 5 go into 10? 5 goes into 10 two times, so 5 goes into 1.0. 0.2 times. 5 times 0.2 is 1. And now we have a remainder of 0. So 486 divided by 5 is 97.2. So this means that each person, each team member, should receive $97.20. Number 4. Carla is deciding whether to purchase a four pound bag of rice for $3.69 or a five pound bag of rice for $4.15. Which item offers the best value? So what do you think we need to do in this problem? Is it better for her to buy the four pound bag of rice or the five pound bag of rice? Well, she needs to determine the unit price of each item, that is the cost per pound. So for the four pound bag of rice, the unit price is going to be the cost of the item divided by the weight of the item, in this case, four pounds. So if we divide 3.69 by four, we get a unit price of $0.9225 per pound. So now let's calculate the unit price for the other item, for the five pound bag of rice. So the cost for that is $4.15. And we're gonna divide it by five pounds. So 4.15 divided by five gives us a unit price of 83 cents per pound. So now comparing these two values, which item offers the better deal? Would you say item A or item B? Well, item B has the lowest price per unit. So therefore, 
you're getting more rice at a lower price. So item B offers the best value. Now let's move on to the next problem. Timothy spends $50 eating at a restaurant. He wishes to give the waiter a 15% tip. How much money should Timothy leave on the table? In order to calculate the tip, we need to determine the value of 15% of $50. So how can we find 15% of 50? Well, let's perform mental math. First, let's calculate the value of 10%. 10% of a number, in order to find it, just move the decimal one unit to the left. So 10% of 50 is simply $5. If 10% is $5, what's 5%? But we know that 5% is half of 10%. So 5% has to be half of $5. Half of $5 is $2.50. So 15% is going to be the sum of 10% and 5%. 10% plus 5% is 15%. Thus 15% will be the sum of these two numbers. 5 plus 250 is $7.50. So that's how you can mentally do a simple uh, percentage problem in your head. Now here's how you can check your work. 15% of 50 is the same as $50 times 15% as a decimal. To convert a percent into a decimal, simply divide by 100. 15 divided by 100 is 0.15. So we're going to multiply 50 by 0.15. If you multiply these two, you're going to get $7.50. So that's going to equate to a 15% tip. Thus, that's how much money Tim should leave on the table for the waiter. Now let's move on to number six. Megan has $50,000 in a checking account that pays a simple interest of 2% on an annual basis. How much interest will Megan receive each year if she continues to maintain a checking balance of 50,000 or 50K. Well, for this problem, we need to be familiar with the formula for simple interest. The simple interest formula is as follows. I is equal to PRT. I is the simple interest that will be credited to the account on an annual basis. P is the principal, which is 50,000. R is the interest rate which we need to convert it to a decimal. So to convert 2% to a decimal, divide by 100, or you can move the decimal point two units to the left. If you move it two units to the left, you're going to get 0 0.02. So that's going to be our R value. Now, we want to calculate the simple interest per year. We're not looking for the total interest in five or 10 years. We just want to see how much interest she will receive each year if she maintains the checking balance of 50,000. So we're going to choose a T value of one year. So what is 2% of 50,000? Let's see if we can perform mental math to get the answer. Well, first, what is 10% of 50,000? 10% of 50,000 is 5,000. Just move the decimal one unit to the left. So if 10% is 5,000, what's 1%? 1% is going to be 500. Simply move the decimal two units to the left. If 1% is 500, what's 2%? 2% is twice the value of 1%. So it's going to be twice the value of 500, which is 1,000. So that's how much interest she's going to receive each year in this checking account. And you could check it. If you multiply 50,000 by 0 0.02, you're going to get a thousand. So if she maintains a check and balance of 50,000 each year, she's going to receive a thousand dollars in this account. Now let's move on to number seven. Greg buys a laptop that costs $599. He uses a coupon code that offers a 20% discount. And then a sales tax of $7 is applied after the discount. What is the total amount of money that Greg will spend on his laptop? So first, we need to find out what 
of $599 is. So we're not going to do this mentally. If it was 600, then it would be easy to do it mentally. 10% of 600 is 60. So 20% of 600 is going to be twice the value of 60. It's going to be 120. So 600 is very close to 599. So we know that 20% is just under 120. So let's multiply 599 by 20% or by 0.20. So this is going to be $119.80. So when he receives a 20% discount, the price of the laptop is going to be reduced by $119.80. So now let's subtract these two numbers using a calculator. you should get $479.20. So this is the price after the 20% discount. But now, a sales tax of 7% is going to be applied to this amount. So we're going to find out what 7% of $479.20 is. So converting 7% to a decimal, it's going to be 0 0.07. That is, if we divide that by a, 100. So 479.20 times 0 0.07, that's $33.54. So I'm going to round it to the nearest whole number. So the price is going to increase by this amount. So let's add these two numbers. Four plus zero is four, five plus two is seven, three plus nine is twelve, write the two, carry the one. One plus seven is eight, plus three, that's eleven, and then four plus one is five. So this is going to be the final price, five hundred and twelve dollars and seventy four cents. Now I'm going to show you another way to get the same answer using this formula. The new price is equal to 1 plus or minus R times the original price. So the original price is $599. And we want to discount it by 20%. So the new price is what we're looking for. Because it's a discount, R is going to be negative. 20%, if you divide by 100, that's 0.20 and then times the original price of $599. So one minus 0 0.20 is 0.80. So we're looking for 80% of 599. 0.80 times 599 gives us $479.20. From here, we're gonna add a 7% tax. So the price is gonna increase. So the new price is gonna be 1 plus R instead of minus because the price is going up. So we're going to use the positive sign and R is 0.07 or 7%. And we're going to multiply it by the original price or the previous price, which is $479.20. So 1 plus 0.07, that's 1.07 times 479.20. And that gives you the final answer of $512.00. And 74 cents. So that's another way in which you can calculate the final price after a discount and a sales tax is applied. Number eight, Andrew invests 30,000 in a mutual fund that grows on average 10% each year. At this rate, what will be the value of the mutual fund after 20 years? Well, there's two formulas that can help us estimate the answer. This is the compound interest formula, where if we know how much interest is being credited to an account, we can calculate the final value after some time t. If interest is credited once per year, n is 1. If it's credited quarterly or four times a year, n is 4. Monthly, n is 12, since it's 12 months in a year. 
Now, if interest is compounded continuously, we would use this formula. Now, in this problem, it doesn't tell us how often interest is credited to the account. And the mutual fund, it just grows continuously. So the best formula to use in this case would be this one. But we can compare it to this one as well. So in this formula, P is the principal or the amount invested. That's 30,000. E is a number. It's 2.7182818. It's the inverse of the natural log function. R is 10%. And as a decimal, that's 0.10. And T is the time in years, which is going to be 20 years. So if you plug that into your calculator, 30,000 times E raised to the 0.10 times 20, it will give you 221,671 dollars and 68 cents. So this is going to be the value of the mutual fund after 20 years, if it grows on 10%, if it grows 10% each year on average. Now let's compare this answer to another answer that we would get in a different situation. So let's say Andrew invests 30,000 in an account that pays him 10% interest once per year. So it's not compounding continuously, but the account is credited with interest once per year. In this case, we would use this formula. So P would be the same. It's still 30,000. R is still 0.10, but N is one and T is 20. So one plus 0.10 is 1.10. So it's gonna be 30,000 times 1.10 raised to the 20th power. And the answer is gonna be Two hundred and one thousand and eight hundred twenty five dollars. So that's if the account receives interest once per year at ten percent. But if it grows continuously, notice that the difference is about twenty thousand, which over time that's significant. So if you can increase the value of N or the number of times that interest is credited to an account, the value of the account over time will be greater. So compounding the account with interest continuously is better than crediting the account once per year. Number nine, David buys a house for 200,000. After 10 years, the value of the house is 320,000. What is David's return on investment? To calculate David's ROI, it's gonna be the amount of profit that he realizes divided by the cost of investment times 100%. So the profit that he realizes if he sells his home when it's worth 320,000, it's the difference between the price that he sells it at and the price that he paid for. So his profit is going to be 120,000. Now the cost of investment was 200,000. That's much money it took to buy the house. And we're going to multiply that by 100%. So 120,000 divided by 200,000 is 0.6. If you multiply that by 100%, you'll get 60%. So that's his return on investment over the course of 10 years. Now let's work on the last problem. Julia takes out a 30-year $250,000 loan at a fixed interest rate of 4% to buy a home. Calculate Julia's monthly mortgage payment. There's a formula that we could use to calculate the monthly payment. It's equal to the principal times the monthly interest rate divided by one minus one plus R raised to the negative N. Let me write this better. Now 
Now n is the number of payments that will be made over the course of 30 years. So let's write out what we know. The principal is the value of the loan, that's 250000 The monthly interest rate is going to be the fixed interest rate of 4% divided by 12 months in a year. So 4 divided by 12, well, this is 0 0.04 as a decimal, so it's really 0 0.04 divided by 12. And 0 0.04 divided by 12, that's 0 0.003 repeated. So I'm going to leave it like this for now. Now, N is going to be 30 years times 12 months. So she's going to make a total of 360 monthly payments. Each year, she's going to make 12 payments, and she's going to do it for 30 years. So in 30 years, she's going to make 360 monthly payments. So that's our N value. So now let's plug in everything into this formula. So it's 250,000 times r, so that's 0 0.04 divided by 12, and then this is going to be 1 minus 1 plus r, that's 0 0.04 over 12, and this is going to be raised to negative n, or negative 360. So now let's multiply 250,000 by 0 0.04, and then let's divide that by 12. So on top, we have 833.3 repeated. So I'm going to write a few threes after that. And then it's going to be 1 minus. Now 1 plus 0 0.04 divided by 12, that's 1.003 repeated. We're going to raise that to the negative 360 power. So it's going to be 1 minus 0 0.30175. So let's subtract the two numbers on the bottom. 1 minus 0 0.30179865. 95865. That's 0 0.69820413535. Now let's divide these two numbers. So the monthly mortgage payment is going to be 1000 one hundred ninety three dollars and fifty four cents so that's how much Julia is gonna to have to pay each month to repay this loan over the course of 30 years so that's the answer to part a now let's move on to part B what is the total amount of money that she will have to repay over 30 years? So she's paying this amount each month. There's 12 months in a year. Over 30 years, she's going to pay, she's going to make 360 monthly payments. So we need to multiply this number by the 360 monthly payments that she's going to make in the course of 30 years. So this is the total amount that she's going to pay back, $429,674.40. So this number includes the original principal plus interest. So to calculate the total interest that she's going to pay for this loan, we'll need to subtract the total amount of payments that she's going to make over 30 years by the principal amount or the original cost of the loan. So in the course of 30 years, she's going to pay $179,674.40 in interest, which is a lot. So you could reduce this if you can get a loan at a better interest rate. The lower the interest rate, the lower this value will be. And also, the faster you can pay off the loan, the lower the total interest that you'll pay over time. 
she's paying this loan over 30 years. If she were to reduce it to a 20-year loan or a 10-year loan, the mortgage payment will be higher, but the total interest that she will pay over time will be less. So that's it for this video. Hopefully, it gave you a good introduction into the basic math that you might encounter in everyday life.